So I have the task in the next uh, 20 minutes or so about introducing you to a class of agents that I think is going to be increasingly important in IBD. And these are agents targeting the IL-12 and 23 pathway. So it's time that we all start learning about this pathway, how it works, and what it is capable of. A few disclosures to highlight, um, Abby, Amgen, Janssen, Metamune, and Novartis I've been a consultant for, and I'll mention some of their agents in this talk. So we'll talk about the biology of IL-12 and IL-23, which overlaps to some degree. And we'll also talk about the, what is known at this point about the safety and efficacy of anti-P40 antibodies and anti-P19 antibodies. So here, here is the family, the IL-12 cytokine family, very colorful display here. Uh, but the key ones to look at are the ones on the left. So we'll be talking about IL-23, which comp is comprised by, uh, it's a heterodimer comprised by P19 subunit and a P40 subunit. IL-12 shares the P40 subunit, but instead is paired with the P35. Downstream, there's intracellular sig signaling through the JAK and STAT pathways, and the net result is a pro-inflammatory effect. I won't talk about JAK and STAT. Um, that I'll leave to uh, Bill Sanborn in the next talk. Uh, but this is a very important family. You see that some of the family members are pro-inflammatory, some are inhibitory, and there's a lot of sharing of uh, components of the the molecule that is the receptor for these cytokines. Now, this is obviously intended to look at the pathophysiology in skin, so probably psoriasis, but uh, the same sort of uh, cycle applies in the gut as well. And in fact, we know that IL-12 and IL-23 are very important uh, cytokines for gut homeostasis, particularly IL-23, as you'll see. So what we know is that traditionally we had thought of Crohn's disease as being a disease of Th1 uh, effector arm. But in fact, uh, we, we understand better that it may be more of a combination of Th1 and so-called Th17 type uh, responses. And Th17 is driven by IL-23, whereas Th1 is driven by IL-12. Downstream of, T, of Th1, are things that we're all used to hearing about for a couple of decades now, tumor necrosis factor, interferon gamma. We know that blocking TNF is highly effective um, and a very protein cytokine. Uh, we're less used to hearing about things down the Th17 arm of effector cells. So one might say that perhaps blocking IL-17 itself should be an effective therapy in Crohn's disease if we think that the response is more of a Th17-like response. In fact, this uh, strategy of cytokine blockade does not seem to be effective. Um, there are now two studies showing that when you block IL-17 directly, either with an antibody directly against IL-17, uh, and in this case we're looking at the results with secukinumab, um, you don't actually see benefit. And in fact, what you see is that the placebo arm has better response than the, the patients who got secukinumab for their Crohn's disease. So it actually seems to perhaps worsen the disease. And this result was somewhat replicated in another phase two study of AMG827, which was not targeting the cytokine, but the receptor for IL-17. And in this study, there was literally worsening of patients who were treated with the drug and the higher the dose, the worsening of the disease. And the, the study was terminated prematurely because of an imbalance in worsening Crohn's disease in the active treatment groups. Um, so this raises concern. It also tells you that even though this may be an important cytokine pathway, um, blocking IL-17 is not synonymous with blocking Th17 effector cells and blocking the pathway. So there's obviously more to the biology than that. The other clue that we get from biology is actually through genetics. So for uh, going on 10 years now, we've understood that IL-23 receptor polymorphisms are an important finding uh, in, in uh, risk for inflammatory bowel disease. Importantly, it's both a factor in Crohn's disease susceptibility and ulcerative colitis, which gives you a hint that this pathway may be a target for both diseases, even though all the data that I'm going to show you is in Crohn's disease. And very importantly, there are multiple independent alleles and as well a protective minor allele, meaning if you have this particular allele of the IL-23 receptor, 
then you're far less likely to have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. You're protected from the disease, which suggests that if you block IL-23, you may actually see benefit in treatment of the disease. So what do we see in the clinic? When we put these things to the test, uh, the first approach was anti-P40 antibodies. So recall that P40 is common to IL-12 and IL-23. So an anti-P40 antibody is going to block both of these important cytokines. And the first agent that looked at this in the clinic was ABT874, also called briakinumab. The second one that came along and more successful is ustekinumab. So I'll spend most of my time talking about ustekinumab. So ABT874 was originally conceived of as an anti-IL-12 antibody. At the time that this agent was studied, it actually wasn't known that this also blocked IL-23. In fact, I'm not even sure that IL-23 had yet been described uh, in the list of, ongoing list of numbers of cytokines and Maybe one of our basic science friends can tell me what number we're up to. It's probably 2020. Um, but this was a study by Peter Mannon, and it was a relatively small and very complicated study, uh, but it was sufficiently powerful to make it into the New England Journal. And you can see, I won't go through all the different cohorts, but there was a suggestion that uh, this agent could be effective in Crohn's disease, and it was an entirely novel mechanism. The next agent that came along uh, or this is the same agent, briakinumab, the next study that came along was the phase B in Crohn's disease. And here, unfortunately, this agent was studied against placebo, two different flat doses of 400 milligrams or 700 milligrams, and the primary outcome was intended to be week six. And what you can see is that there was no significant difference from placebo at week six, although at week 12, um, the secondary analyses did show at least nominal statistical significance for the middle dose of briakinumab, the 400 milligram dose, 29% achieving remission versus 11%. Now, these stu this study, even though it was published just uh, this past year, uh, was done a number of years ago, and it did not do a number of things to try to control the placebo response rate. However, you can see that the res placebo response rate here is not really what what upturned the study, that actually the placebo remission rates here were quite low. Um, looking at some of the out other outcomes, uh, looking at clinical response, you see that uh, this was fairly equivalent between the two dosing regimens, um, and there seemed to be a numerical advantage um, and statistical significance, at least for um, the higher dose at week six um, and at week 12 as well. Um, but in point of fact, this agent, because of these weak overall results and missing its primary endpoint, did not move on further in development. Nevertheless, I think it shows you there is some signal here, but it wasn't strong enough with this agent to proceed. Last few bits of uh, post-mortem analysis for the study. Did it matter if the patient had higher CRP or lower CRP? It didn't really help very much, although you can see that the placebo response was lowered even further uh, didn't achieve statistical significance. Note these are very small numbers of patients. And if you also looked at the TNF-naive patients, you see both the placebo response and the highest drug dose response going up. So you get a glimmer of something, but just not enough to go on with. But then we come to ustekinumab, uh, formerly known as CNTO-1275. And this agent uh, is marketed already as a very effective treatment for psoriasis. It's well known that the IL-17 pathway is uh, very important in psoriasis, um, and IL-23 is important as well, as well as IL-12. So this is a highly effective agent in psoriasis. Um, in fact, blocking IL-17 itself also seems to be effective in psoriasis. But in this case, uh, this was an early phase study. And uh, again, without going through uh, all the complexities of the dosing regimens, and this had many different variations of dosing, the key finding here was that uh, there was early efficacy, particularly in the patients who had had prior exposure to infliximab. So here we're looking at clinical response through week eight, and you see even at week two, uh, this study achieved statistical significance, even with small numbers of patient studies studied. It's important to note that the initial delivery was IV and the follow-up doses were sub-Q, uh, but you see almost all of the response in week two and certainly by week four here, and uh, superiority over placebo dosing. Uh, 
So this led to the Certify study, which was published three years ago in the New England Journal, which showed both induction and maintenance data. And I have to uh, credit you know, one champion. It sometimes takes one champion in the corporate world to bring preliminary findings forward. I'm, I think it's safe to say that within the company that was developing Eustachinumab, there was not universal agreement that this drug should be going forward to uh, be developed in Crohn's disease, because the analyses that I showed you were secondary or maybe even post hoc analyses. So it's very risky to go forward on that basis. Uh, but Marion Blank, who was in the company that manufactures Eustachinumab, I, I would say was a major champion for this, pushed it forward. And in the Certify study, um, really what you saw based on those early results is an entire study comprised of patients who had been on TNF blockade before, um, either one in half the patients or two in about a third, and 11% overall had been on three prior TNF antagonists. So this is going to be a highly refractory group of patients without any question. And in fact, um, about a third of these patients had inadequate initial primary response to anti-TNF, what you would call primary non-responders. So really a very difficult group of patients. And here are the results for the induction phase. There were three different doses used uh, based on weight-based dosing, one milligram, three milligrams, or six milligrams per kilogram. Compared to placebo, you can see um, early efficacy in terms of clinical response and clinical remission at week four, but certainly at week eight. It does seem that at week eight, uh, the highest dose, the six milligrams per kilogram, was superior to the other doses, at least numerically, if not in the actual statistical comparison, and definitely superior over placebo. Uh, for remission, you don't see much of a difference between the different doses, so this probably requires further exploration. In the maintenance phase, this looks really good. If you, this is a drug with a very long half-life, and you can see that the durability of response for clinical response and clinical remission, clinical remission over six months of follow-up is, is truly excellent. There really uh, very little loss of response as these patients are followed over half a year. What about adverse events? You would expect, given uh, the protein effects of IL-12 and IL-23, that blocking these cytokines would have really significant impact on, say, risk of infection. But in fact, um, you don't see any signal of infection in the short-term study, and I'll show you the, uh, the six-month data from Certify. Um, in fact, what you do see is a decrease in uh, serious adverse events in the treated patients, and mostly these are serious adverse events related to activity of the Crohn's disease itself. So you see more of those in the placebo-treated patients. It's the same story in weeks 8 through 36 in terms of infections. Um, you see maybe um, a tiny increased risk of infections, but mainly in the patients who um, did not have response initially to eustachinumab at week six. And you really don't see that. In fact, you see a lower numerical uh, risk of infections in the responders at week six. So it looks surprisingly good in terms of safety. So then we move to the Unity 3, uh, phase three Crohn's program. Uh, this is the pivot, these are the pivotal trials that, in theory, should lead to the approval of the drug. Uh, Bill Sanborn was very kind enough to share these slides with me. He presented these data yesterday. But um, if you've only seen them once, I think it's worth seeing them again. So Unity 1 and Unity 2 had identical designs, slightly different numbers of patients enrolled, but a very simple study design where patients were randomized to get placebo IV initially, Stellara, uh, which should be uh, really used to Kinemab, sorry for the trade name, uh, 130 milligrams or six milligrams per kilogram IV. Um, so that was the same design in both studies. And uh, the differences between the treatment populations were TNF failure population in Unity 1 and failing conventional therapy in Unity 2. The week six responders were then re-randomized to either get placebo or 90 milligrams sub-Q every 12 weeks or every eight weeks and followed through for 44 weeks. And then there's a long-term extension study as well. So we'll show you the induction data primarily from Unity 1. So who are these patients that had moderate to severely active Crohn's disease? 
Uh, they had a CDAI between 220 and 450 of at least three months duration. They had failed one or more approved anti-TNF agents, either because of primary non-response or secondary non-response or intolerance. So this was very identical to the certify 2B phase uh, study population. Um, so that's the study design, very simple. They were followed out, and uh, the maintenance study was immunity, it was called. Um, the weight-based dosing of roughly six milligrams per kilogram was sort of a graduated uh, step scale, if you would, 260 for those who were less than or equal to 55 kilograms, between 56 and 85 kilograms, got 390 and 520 for more than 85 kilograms. What did these patients look like? They had uh, an average CDAI score of 317, so really quite moderately sick. They had about 10 years of Crohn's duration. This was not a naive population. It's not a new diagnosed population. Um, CRP was on average 9 or 10, and uh, more than three quarters of patients had an abnormal CRP as it was measured. Um, you can see here the concomitant medications, immune modulators in a third of patients overall, uh, corticosteroids in almost half of patients, and the ones who were on it had an average of uh, 19 prednisone equivalent milligrams. With regard to the prior TNF history, nearly half the patients had failed just one, but 40% failed two TNF antagonists and 10% failed three, very similar to what was seen in CERTIFY. And here's the primary analysis. The primary endpoint here is clinical response at week six, um, as denoted by a 100 or more point drop from the baseline CDAI. You see a typically, somewhat typically fairly high placebo response of 21.5%, but both the 130 milligram flat dose and the roughly six milligram per kilogram dose uh, achieve statistical significance by comparison, uh, a treatment effect of about 12% or so. And major secondary endpoint is remission. You can see that here, the roughly six milligram per kilogram group seemed to perform numerically better a bit than the lower dose of 130 milligrams. So there it was 20.9% versus placebo of 7.3%. So that looks good. And then if you look at the onset of effect in Unity 1 and Unity 2, Unity 1, uh, you, you continue to see some benefit uh, over the eight weeks, but most of the benefit in both studies, well, particularly in the TNF refractory study, is in the first three weeks. As you can see, 30% uh, achieved that clinical response by three weeks and 37.8% by week eight. Um, for the patients who failed conventional therapy in Unity 2, who were primarily uh, mostly TNF naive, um, you, you continue to see more, uh, uh, an increase in response rates even through week six and, and week eight, but most of the response is through week six. Clinical remission, um, again, a somewhat different impression here. You can see more remission occurring uh, over the eight weeks in Unity 1, and you certainly saw the same phenomenon in Unity 2. If you want to look at kind of an older uh, standard for response, the 70-point drop through week eight, um, you get a similar impression as you got with the 100-point drop. What about biomarkers of response? Well, in Unity 1, uh, which were the TNF refractory group, actually the placebo-treated patients continued to have a rise in their CRP, whereas uh, the treated groups had uh, very similar drops in their CRP that were maintained over eight weeks and really occurred by week three. And in Unity 2, interestingly, you saw more, more robust suppression, even beyond the level seen in Unity 1, uh, particularly in the higher dosing group again, suggesting that the higher dosing group may be a little bit more effective. What about the key safety events? Um, here, uh, really, again, you have the same impression that there is not an increased risk of infections. These look uh, very similar in, in regard to malignancies, infections, serious adverse events, uh, really look quite similar across the board. So now we'll turn away from blocking P40 and instead consider whether blocking P19 alone, which will only inhibit uh, IL-23, whether that might be an effective strategy. 
And why would you want to do it? It would seem better to cover a little bit more, cover two cytokines, that may be a little more effective. But can you get the same sort of efficacy with blocking IL-23 alone? Would there be any theoretical advantages to that? Well, we have to go back to a little bit of uh, basic uh, science data in mouse, and uh, we have to credit Chuck Elson and his group for studying this first, where anti-IL-23, really anti-P19-treated uh, skid mouse model colitis, really this seemed to be a highly effective modality for the skid mouse model, which is a very vigorous kind of colitis model and tough to treat. And in fact, they concluded that quite a number of cytokines uh, in IL-23 deficient mouse, this is another group, uh, when you have IL-23 deficient mice and you produce colitis, there's a lot less production of a whole variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the conclusion from the study that was that IL-23, but not IL-20, uh, but IL-12, is essential for induction of chronic intestinal inflammation mediated by innate or adaptive immune mechanisms. And depletion of IL-23 was associated with decreased pro-inflammatory responses in the intestine, but interestingly had little impact on systemic T-cell inflammatory responses. Now, if you also go to animal models and let's call them human models of uh, absolute deficiency of IL-12, when you totally block IL-12, you see all kinds of susceptibilities to mycobacteria, salmonella, leishmania, cryptosporidium, and so on. Um, and in humans, you see susceptibility to mycobacterium and salmonella as well and a variety of other things. Now, granted, when you give an antibody against P40, you're not completely eliminating IL-12 or IL-23, so this may not be relevant, really. And I told you that this looks very safe in the clinic, so uh, it's a theoretical safety advantage. By contrast, you don't see the same thing when you block IL-23. You don't see systemic susceptibility to all these kinds of infections, and there are not any reported human deficiencies of IL-23 or P19. So in closing, I'll show you the one bit of data from the one study so far where P19 antibody has been looked at, and this was MEDI-2070, uh, an anti-P19 antibody, and this was looked at in a relatively small phase two study in Crohn's disease, and here I'm simply showing you the week eight uh, modified intention to treat population where uh, this study, even though small and somewhat underpowered, achieved uh, significant statistically in CDAI response and 100 100 point improvement numerically, but not statistically in CDAI remission. So it looks like IL-23 blockade could be effective as well, and the safety profile in this short-term study also looked very favorable. There are at least uh, two or three other anti-P19 antibodies out there in various phases of study. So without question, we're going to see a, a whole raft of different agents uh, targeting this axis. So in conclusion, I would say that IL-12 and 23 are really critical cytokines in both adaptive and innate immunity. Anti-P40 antibody, particularly used to kinemab, targets both IL-12 and 23, and it appears to be effective and safe in Crohn's disease. Uh, we have not seen publicly the maintenance data for this yet, except in certify over six months. Ustekinumab is effective in both TNF-experienced and TNF-naive Crohn's disease patients, as was shown in the pairing of Unity 1 and Unity 2. Uh, there's growing evidence that anti-P19 antibody, which targets only IL-23, will also be effective in Crohn's disease. And uh, we don't really know whether there's any safety advantage of one approach over the other. And I think the concluding thought is that uh, this may well be effective in ulcerative colitis as well, but we have not a shred of human data as yet. I expect we will in the coming year or two. So with that, I'll end, and thanks very much for listening.